Um, today we will talk about the most recent wave of protests in Thailand. Um, right now there's a bit of a quiet period, I would say. Um, since December there has been uh, COVID cases again in Thailand. Right now it's about 100 to 200 a day. And also some of the protest group, groups have announced that they, they uh, are doing a break until it, it is gone again. So Chan Chi Rao, without uh, further ado, um, we saw this autumn in Thailand from, I would say, July to December. We saw many, many people, mostly young people, going to the streets. When you saw this happening, what was your first reaction? What did you think? Um, so first of all, um, thanks, Lucas, and uh, Asia, uh, Asia Society for having me. Um, my first impression uh, was hope, really. Um, I think that um, one could say that the um, the July protest um, and even the August protest um, were the largest that um, Thailand has seen since 2014. And there are um, a number of reasons for um, limited protests in Thailand since the coup in 2014. Um, of the obvious reason is the, um, the um, systematic crackdown of dissidents in Thailand. And therefore, a lot of people were a bit um, concerned, if not uh, scared to come out to the streets. And I think that um, the protests in July onward um, gave you a lot of hope that despite everything, despite the crackdown, despite the arrest, despite the threats, um, Thai youngsters and Thai people in general are not afraid of that. And um, I think that it gives a lot of hope for a pro-democracy movement. I have to say that from my part, it did catch me by surprise because in Thailand, for me, there was this feeling that nothing is happening politically. It felt a bit like stuck. So when all these young kids suddenly were standing in the streets and asking for the prime minister to resign, among other things, I was, I was really, really surprised. So what, what did these young people want in the beginning when they went to the streets in July? What were the main demands? Well, the first group that took to the street, if I'm not mistaken, uh, was um, the uh, Free Youth, Yawa um, Shontot Act, and other affiliated groups, smaller groups, right? Um, the Free Youth, I think, had um, multiple demands, uh, the key ones being, um, you know, the, uh, the cessation of state harassment of citizens and um, other um, demands regarding human rights violation and especially the investigation into the um, the false appearance of an exile activist one shalom and I think that um, I, I think that the protesters uh, the organizers were surprised like you they probably didn't expect that um, the, get, the the protest would gather force or it would kind of gain traction but I think that the the moment was ripe. Um, of course, there were trigger incidents like, you know, the fourth disappearance of this exile activist who uh, were uh, who was in Cambodia, um, and then he just disappeared um, in broad daylight. Uh, he was taken by, um, you know, a, a few men. And then, um, but already before that, in February earlier um, that last year, um, after the constitutional court dissolution of the Future Forward Party, there were already students on the streets and they, their demands were not clear. I think back then it was like the expression of anger and frustration that this political party, which uh, represented the voice of the young people was dissolved um, and seemingly illegitimately. And so I think that the demand in the beginning were not uh, clearly formulated up until I would say um, August and September, then we started to see um, demands uh, regarding the vaccination of Prime Minister Prayut Chan Osha, and then um, uh, the amendment of the constitution. And last but not least, the most controversial demand is the reform of the monarchy. I, I would agree. And it, for me, standing on the streets and listening to the young people, and in the beginning, they were shouting, uh, Prime Minister should resign. and then suddenly two, three months later, they were shouting things relating to the monarchy that I probably do better not mention on air. So there was this very rapid shift from, from the demands towards also a reform of the monarchy, which no one expected. Why do you think did this happen? Or why was this possible last autumn? 
I, I think that um, in order to understand um, the the rational, the the, the reason behind um, this demand, one has to kind of trace back um, Thailand's entrenched autocratization, meaning that, you know, um, when we talk about drivers of this protest, um, you, you, you tend to see trigger events like the dissolution of the Future Forward Party and the forced disappearance of Wan Shalom. But then um, underlying all of this is Thailand's worrying trend of deeper and deeper uh, autocratization, meaning that um, the establishment of the country um, when facing um, a threat from uh, pro-democracy forces, instead of dealing with that with democratic means, you know, allowing free and fair um, uh, elections and, you know, uh, um, uh, debating ideas with them, for example, the establishment um, try to eliminate this threat. And therefore, um, they kind of associate uh, pro-democracy forces with um, democracy as a, a system of governance. So, and therefore, Thailand has been on this journey of like trying to uh, getting trying to get rid of democracy since 2006, as we all know, right? And so, from 2006 until 2019, the autocratic regime in Thailand has been deepened. Um, each time the coup was launched, each time the judicial um, uh, um, intervention took place, right? And so I think that um, this deepened autocratization in Thailand comes at the price of eroding state capacities. What do I mean by this? Um, as a Thai, you now see um, the use of the widespread use of draconian laws. And in fact, laws have been weaponized to um, to crack down on political uh, oppositions and, you know, um, basically the public enemy deemed by the establishment. And so um, uh, laws uh, as an institution is being uh, mistrusted by a large part of the population and the rule of law is eroding and therefore you have like unchecked power of the power that be. Um, therefore you have, you started to have unchecked power of the royal institution alongside with other uh, key institutions in Thailand. And so this unchecked power um, has led to a number of incidents that show the, um, the citizens that there is no um, sense of justice in the country, um, there is no fair share, and the, the distribution of power and wealth is limited. And so I think that um, the, the demand regarding the monarchy was formulated in this light that people started to see the political role of the royal institution in this dynamics of autocratic regime that has led to unchecked executive power in Thailand, right? And so I think that protesters more and more um, see the visible role uh, of, of this institution and therefore they want um, the institution to be more shaped in a democratic way. Uh, you mentioned incidents which showed the people in Bangkok uh, that the system is unfair. Could you make one example of one such inc incident? Well, I would say that um, we, without going into details of like, you know, uh, democracy is good and uh, not having democracy is bad, this normative kind of argument, um, just look at corruption, right? Um, so there's a, a, a widespread um, impunity amongst um, allies of the elites, um, the, the bureaucrats that uh, took part in shaping the autocratic regime, right? And so, for example, um, this politician who was uh, um, charged in Australia of uh, possessing drugs and um, by using this very um, um, absurd uh, excuse and, and lies for many people, um, he can get away with it. And even though this is a real legal charge, then he was not uh, stripped of his political title. So the same, that's the same standard does not apply to the political opponents of the establishment. 
right? And so there's this like, on the one hand, the impunity that the elite have uh, generated among themselves, right? And on the other hand, the, the legal um, kind of crackdown, the legal application is harshly um, forced or enforced onto um, the opposition. So I think that there is a clear sense of um, double standard. There's a clear sense of injustice. And this is just one amongst many other incidents that have happened again and again and again. And I think that uh, the, the resentment, the popular resentment has accumulated. This is also something you can see when, you, when you're in the streets at the protests, like people holding up signs, like everyone is just human, we are all the same. So you can see this also expressed a lot in the, in the slogans and, right. and, and people right. are carrying it. Yeah, and I think that at some point you will see, um, um, I would say someone uh, pointing uh, the root cause of this to the feudal structure in Thailand. And I think that is very spot on because only in feudal society um, do the, um, the feudal elite uh, get away with the wrongdoings, right? Because they have privileges. And I think that the systematic um, privileges of the elites have upset um, ordinary ties who cannot have access to that privileges. I want to show a quick video, um, which is a, an excerpt from an interview I did with an activist in Bangkok in last October. Um, her name is Chonti Cha Chang Rao, and she is kind of one of the older activists. She was politicized uh, after the coup in 2014. And now during the protest, she's kind of second row, but she's the one on the ground who is doing a lot of uh, talking with the police and managing the crowd and so on. And I asked her um, how she became politicized and why she's protesting today. <laughs> ในวันนั้นน่ะเราเห็นเพื่อนของเราที่ต้องตัดสินใจลี้ภัยทางการเมืองเพราะว่ารัฐบาลมันเกิดขึ้นแล้วแล้วเขาไม่มั่นใจว
the first stage of her activism was actually to free herself from her own conservative family. And in the second stage, she became a political activist. What I find very interesting about what she's saying is that uh, she also mentions economic reasons um, that people her age in her middle class struggle to buy a car or a, or a house today in, in Bangkok. So is it all about the economy in the end? What do you think, Sanjira? I, I think that the economic reason is very intertwined with the arrangements of political power in Thailand, right? Um, so in Thailand, um, the traditional elites that are holding massive political power also have massive economic power, meaning that they can control the economy, they have access to the economy, and um, therefore they have access to unlimited opportunities in their life. And I mean, just think about education. I think education is a really good example of inequality in Thailand, right? So education system in Thailand is one of the most conservative education system, I would say in, in the world, not only in Asia. And, and that conservative um, system of education doesn't really provide you uh, for this fast changing world, right? And therefore, you know, a lot of students have to, um, in order to get into a good university, they have to go to grammar school and they have to pay for that. And that, that means that parents need money. And in order to get to a good university, then you have to go to a good high school and then good primary school. And this conservative, uh, uh, conservative education system does not create this high quality um, schools and therefore you have to go outside the official system in order to access good education and therefore you need money and therefore you need to come from a middle class or wealthy family to, in order to get that education and therefore get a better chance in life and I think that um, only, only that example shows you um, that the elites have no interest in reshaping the education system in order to provide equal opportunities for everyone. And we, we do not mention about um, the, the, the education that is quite expensive in Thailand, right? It's not free, um, right? And so I think that um, in Thailand, it, inequality is a part of our everyday life, yeah? And I think that young people, especially the young people from middle-class family, are seeing that more and more because fundamentally because middle class in Thailand is dwindling. And that is because the elites have concentrated wealth to their um, cliques and allies. And I think that um, this is why the young people, it, it's not that they are concerned only about democracy, but I think they associate democracy with opportunities in life. Now we have seen this protest in Bangkok, mostly um, a very vocal minority, like I would say very good at like using media also to their own cause and being on the internet. How much support do these protests have outside of Bangkok and in the general population, also maybe the older population of Thailand? Um, that is the challenge at the moment. I think that um, uh, the use of social media has is, um, benefit that is advantage. Um, you can organize a plot protest pretty fast and you can mobilize a protest pretty fast and do it in a very creative way. Um, but then the, the message gets stuck in your own constituents, right? And um, in, in um, uh, a popular language now we call that uh, echo chamber or social media fil uh, filter, filter bubble. And I think um, because of that, because of the popularity of Twitter among young uh, protesters, there is a sense of um, uh, equating uh, Twitter world with the world outside Twitter, meaning that you know, uh, what is going on in Twitter um, is uh, assumed uh, to be happening outside Twitter as well, but that's not always the case in Thailand. Thailand, um, is still a very conservative country. And when it comes to um, the discussion about the monarchy, um, one has to be um, quite sensitive, um, especially the language being used to discuss this. And I think that 
this is why we need to think about um, the demand regarding the monarchy in two senses. One is the content and the other is the way of communication. In terms of content, I would think that a number of people um, do not necessarily disagree with students. They would actually say that, you know, we need to be able to check royal power, right? But then the way in which this concern is addressed online and offline during the protest, um, I think has not managed to kind of capitalize on this, uh, in fact, the, the popular agreement with um, the content of, of the protesters. And so what happens is um, uh, uh, the use of obscene language, for example, in social media is now uh, transferred in um, um, offline space, Right, and you see that like um, uh, this phenomenon happening on the street, the graffiti and the protest banners and people who agree that uh, royal power should be shaped when they see this, um, they jump ship immediately. Um, they, they, they go back to their comfortable corner being conservative and perhaps harden their support for, for the monarchy. And I, I, I come across these examples quite often these days. It's sometimes quite shocking to see how far these two worlds are, are apart, right? The royalists, mostly the older generations and these young kids, 16 to 22, with a totally different view of timing. Mm. So we have these young kids voicing these demands and they, they're asking for change in Thailand. Uh, how did the government react to this? And did they do it well or not? Well, I think the, the, the reaction has not been quite positive. Um, I think we kind of see a couple of tactics being employed. One is this pretense of accommodation. Um, at some point, the government say, okay, well, listen to students, we'll send our representatives to accept the proposals of students, and then we'll um, appoint a couple of committees to look into this, constitutional amendments, so on and so forth. But the process um, is very, uh, exclusive and um, it remains very autocratic, right? And so this pretense of accommodation is one feature. And then at the same time, there's ongoing um, uh, police use of force um, on the street. Although um, I would argue that the use of force on the street has been quite restricted um, to non-lethal uh, weapons. Um, and therefore we haven't seen, um, you know, a substantive number of injuries or, or even deaths, right? But I think that also has to do with the increasing reliance of Thailand's autocratic regime on uh, what we call lawfare, legal repression, the use of draconian laws to uh, charge activists in a sweeping manner, right? And um, normally um, one activist would get like up to 10, uh, one leading activist would get up to 10 charges or more. The whole point of using law against freedom of expression, against freedom of uh, public assembly is to, um, is to prevent effective mobilization, is to prevent effective defiance of the government. And I think that has been quite successful. Maybe we can also mention here that just uh, today or yesterday, there was a, a case where a woman was charged with uh, Article 112, less much as yeah. which yeah. got 49 years in prison, something like that, for repeated yeah. cases of posting things on social media which were not exactly uh, favorable to the powers. Mm -hmm. But I would say just a quick note to this. I think that um, this um, use of law, uh, weaponization of law, I would say, um, it's also um, hurting the regime. I mean, as I said, uh, the rule of law is eroding fast, right? And um, citizens' trust in law in general is also decreasing fast. So the more um, the regime uses law um, for its political purpose, the less people will um, have trust in, in the legal system. And I think that is for a political science scientist, that is a real problem for any governance. I want to show a second video now. Um, it is a short interview with Farid Bashar Sindhu. He was a young politician. He's in his late 20s. And before he was a member of the Democrat Party, 
in Thailand, which is one of the oldest parties, conservative, I would say, uh, maybe in Christmas we could call it the FDP of Thailand. Doesn't really work, but something to think about. Think. And um, today he's, uh, he's a part of this group that calls itself Progressive Constitution. He left the Democrat Party because they decided to enter into a coalition with the current uh, government, which came from the military. So he was not really aligned with that. And he wants to he's, he wants to reform Thailand within the current political system and is proposing policy measures to that end. And we asked him, can Thailand change now? Can the government respond to these reforms? And how? And is now a good chance to do it? Technically, changes that um, the protesters have proposed are possible um, to drive through um, within the system. I mean, if you go through all three, right, the first one in terms of protection of civil liberties, that's something the government can do straight away. Um, I think, secondly, on the constitution, even though um, the current rules have been put in place that make it quite difficult to amend the constitution, you need about a third of the, the military appointed senators to agree with you to even change any one article in the current constitution, but it's technically possible. And even kind of the proposals to reform the monarchy, um, there are certain aspects which can be implemented through constitutional changes. And there are certain aspects which can be actually dealt with by parliament through changing existing legislation. So what will happen if these changes um, are not, um, or these, uh, these kind of demands are not met or are not listened to? I think in the short term, the government may have been fortunate in the sense that with the COVID second wave coming in, so in the short term, it might buy the government some time, but in the long term, I feel that actually, um, if the government dismisses these demands, um, it's gonna create kind of a pent up discontentment that is waiting to explode once the COVID situation is more under control um, and for, for three reasons. I think firstly, we saw this is exactly what happened when COVID wave one came along um, in the sense that the protest stopped for a bit. And then as soon as the COVID was under control, the protest kind of with all the pent up discontent, um, it basically kind of exploded um, and people took to the streets um, en masse. I think secondly, we, it's also important to point out that the second wave of COVID happened um, because of gov government mismanagement and allegations of government corruption regarding the handling of foreign labor immigration and the lack of enforcement of strict health protocols, including the 14 day quarantine. So um, it actually adds fuel to the discontent that the public has with the current government. And I think the third and final point is that if you look at Thailand's political history, uh, major political changes have often happened alongside major economic crises where question marks were raised on the political and economic order. And I think with this current political crisis and the current economic crisis as a result of COVID, people are uh, starting to ask for a new set of order that is more democratic, more equal, more meritocratic and more um, decentralized. And we notice kind of in Thailand's political history, big structural political changes happen um, normally alongside major economic crises. We saw that the political change from absolute monarchy to democracy happened in 1932, only a few years after the Great Depression. And I think most recently we saw that, um, I would say probably Thailand's most democratic constitution in 1997 um, was passed um, during the same time as the Asian financial crisis back in 1997. So perhaps I think um, in the next year or so, um, this major political and economic restructuring of Thailand uh, might, might, might occur um, if the government is still um, unresponsive to these, to these demands. What do you think, Chan Chira? We have the corona crisis, you have the protests. Um, corona crisis also had a huge hit, for example, on the Thai economy in terms of tourism, which contributed to 20% of GDP, and now it's completely gone. Um, do we have this window for change that Tarek mentions? What do you think? I think this is absolutely important. Um, and um, as a political scientist, we, we think of situations like the pandemic or the economic crisis and the, the crisis of political order as a, a structure, yeah, and an environment. And if there is opportunity like this present, you need people to enact change right, in order for change to happen. If there is no one um, capable enough to enact change, then change will, will, will not find its way. And so just in relation to Thailand, um, 
I think what we've seen is the systematic um, weakening of the opposition parties. And um, the last front we do have is civil society. And that has been uh, recently put down quite heavily by the government. Um, I do have hope that um, like uh, what Parit has said, um, that next this year, there's gonna be another wave of uh, political protest, massive one. But how many times can protests happen and gain traction, right? We have to ask ourselves. And I think that um, I'm afraid that Thailand would again reach the point of fatigue, um, having been exhausted by participating in several protests and no change happens. That's my concern that, you know, the protest this year will not gain as big of a uh, traction as last year. And therefore, even though there is this window of, of opportunity, um, change will be very stagnant if not, not materialized. Um, maybe it's a good time to look quickly at the political system in Thailand, because mm -hmm. as a journalist, I often struggle um, with this when I, for example, I write about the constitutional court, and then people think about it like it's a constitutional court in the European sense. But I feel like this does not tell the whole story. So in a, in a Western democracy, we usually say there's like the three important pillars of democracy. There's the legislature, the judiciary, and the executive. In Thailand, I've heard it multiple times that people would say, well, there's five because you have to include the monarchy and the military. So if you look at this political system, um, who would have to allow change to happen, let's say, or who is pulling the strings today in Thailand? How does this work, Sian? I think um, just a short, uh, a quick note um, regarding the constitutional court. I, I think that's also um, quite fascinating to hear. Um, I, I don't think that we can imagine um, uh, political institutions in Thailand in the modern sense. Um, what you're saying in Europe, that is modern um, political institutions, right? And therefore there's a part, uh, bipartisan, um, the non-partisanship by the court, so on and so forth. But in Thailand, you have to think of this um, as a sports event, I would say, um, and there are two teams and each team um, has their allies and they keep uh, changing sides uh, according to the allies' um, interests, right? And um, that makes more sense when it comes to who is pulling string, yeah? And I think that um, we should not think of the elites as monolithic. Um, the military and the palace um, are not always a unified entity. Um, there's always um, tension between the two um, institutions. And I think that we are now seeing that. Um, we are seeing um, the attempt to, for each institution, the palace and the, the military to uh, take control of the other one. And, and you know, um, the situation is yet to be um, uh, settled, right? And so who is, who is pulling string? I think that we need to um, understand a new setup of elites under the current reign in order to understand the power dynamics um, within the elite cycle. And I think that um, more and more you see um, factions within the military that are affiliated with the palace who are trying to um, uh, override uh, main factions, the other main factions of the military that staged the coup in 2019. And so um, just to make this whole thing short, I would say what's worrying in Thailand is who, is not who is pulling string, but is no one is pulling string because there's a lot of elite competition. And um, what we don't see in public is how this elite competitions um, is, is destabilizing um, Thailand. And a lot of decisions that you are, see, um, you are seeing um, is not consistent at all. Sometimes there, um, there's an attempt to accommodate um, um, the opposition and at times uh, they opt for um, um, blatant um, crackdown and more and more um, this militarized crackdown is being um, unleashed. 
And so I think that um, the elite also lost um, its direction. Just a quick last question before we go international. Um, what do you think is happening in the next month? Where do we go from here? Again, I agree with Perit that um, there's going to be for sure another episode of mass demonstration. Um, I think that the um, simmering economic crisis would um, facilitate this, um, the rise of mass protests um, soon. Um, what is happening next is, I think, depends on a couple of factors. One is how um, the next uh, protest would uh, successfully incorporate economic agenda into their um, campaigns in order to kind of uh, capitalize on the current um, uh, dissatisfaction um, regarding the government's response to economic crisis, right? So that's one thing. And another thing is what I just said, um, how many people want to attend another protest and how hopeful they are about a change by uh, mass uh, mobilization. So, and the other part is the response of the elites. I think that um, more and more we see the uh, reluctance, if not the stubbornness of the um, current government to um, kind of uh, accommodate and um, negotiate with protesters. So I think if there is another episode of protest and there is more crackdown um, by legal means or by the use of force, then we're gonna see more tension. But I would say that because both sides are actually quite weak when it comes to you know, um, uh, action and reaction against each other. So we're gonna see something like a stalemate that would, um, you know, this kind of standoff would last quite long. I think, uh, I think what you said is um, that it's also quite tiring actually to protest is, is a very important point because yeah. when you see these protests on television or streamed on Facebook, it's not the same than actually spend a whole day going out there, public traffic breaks down, then there's tear gas and you miss school and so on. It's, it's not to be underestimated, I think. Yeah. So I'm very curious yeah. if this COVID break gave the protesters new energy or what to do. Yeah, next. yeah. Um, I want to quickly open up the discussion to the whole region. Uh, most, um, most famous protests, I think, that we have seen the last years were in Hong Kong, mm. which uh, were also in some of the methods, I, I would say, a bit similar to Thailand. Mm. There was always this famous uh, milk tea alliance, which was this uh, kind of um, aligning of protest groups between Taiwan and Hong Kong and, and Thailand. Um, is there a connection in your eyes, mm -hmm. or is this a purely Thai thing that we saw last year? One thing for sure is um, there is um, an ideological connection, meaning that there is an actual um, pro-democracy movements that, um, you know, in these uh, three, four countries that share um, first concern about um, the role of China in the region and in, 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 in its influence on um, existing autocratic regimes in the region, right? And secondly, there is um, a sense of solidarity, um, especially when there is um, police crackdown on protesters. And I think that it's not only um, the tactical borrowing between um, these different groups. And I, I would say that the tactical borrowing is quite common among social movements, not only in Asia, but this sense of solidarity when you see um, uh, uh, Thai protesters on the street being, um, uh, uh, you know, being shot with um, tear gas or being shot with water cannons. And I think someone from Hong Kong looking at that, they could cry, they could have tears in their eyes, right? Because that's their experience. Mm -hmm. And I think um, someone from Taiwan looking at uh, the situation in Thailand, they think of their own autocratic experience in the um, 50s up until um, the late 80s, right? And so I think that sense of solidarity is, is very real. Um, the challenge now is how do we go from there to another point of, you know, um, uh, uh, actual collaboration, um, actual support for each other. And I think 
once that kind of uh, networks of support are established, um, then I think we can actually say that the multi alliance is um, in its existence. Uh, I have a question from our viewers. Um, the question is that Thailand seems to be becoming more aware to liberalize trading in relation to Europe and other countries. And uh, often there are like strings attached to that, as we see in Cambodia, like export to Europe is coupled with human rights, mm -hmm. for example. Um, do you think this could be and play any part in the future with these protests too, or should it? I think that um, there, there is actual concern from the EU side. Um, and of course, when it comes to human rights violation in Thailand, there's real concern. And therefore, um, the, the free trade between the, uh, between the EU and Thailand has been held up because of that concern, right? But I think that more and more there could be a push uh, from the EU itself that um, that should not be the case in the future. And in order to counter, um, you know, in order to compete uh, with China or Chinese influence in the region, then these concerns about human rights should be um, downplayed a little bit, I think. And so I, I think that um, I'm not sure that um, um, the protests in Thailand would get um, substantial international support in the future. That's my concern after what happened in the US and you know in a lot of places in the world. I think that there's a declining interest in um, kind of external support uh, for domestic uh, pro-democracy movements.